Hey there, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here's some of the stories we're watching tonight. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan say they were chased through the streets of New York by paparazzi, an irony that is not lost on the mayor there. I don't think there's many of us who don't recall how, uh, how the, uh, his mom uh, died. And a federal appeals court in New Orleans could decide the future of a key abortion pill. President Biden is off to meet with the world's leaders as the biggest threat to the global economy might come from a default here at home. Then in Missouri. I'm not calling anyone. I understand. I can say the word. A Missouri student secretly records her teacher saying the N-word, and she's the one that gets suspended. And tonight, we are still putting together a lot of the exact details of what happened between Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, and the paparazzi last night in New York City. The couple, along with Meghan's mother, was leaving the Ziegfeld Ballroom around 10 o'clock after going to the Women's of Vision Awards. Uh, Harry and Meghan's team say that the chase lasted over two hours, and there were multiple near collisions involving other drivers on the road, pedestrians, and two NYPD officers. They are calling it a near-catastrophic car chase. Now, law enforcement is saying things were chaotic, but they're pushing back a little on the whole near catastrophic description. Nevertheless, New York Mayor Eric Adams is calling the whole thing irresponsible and reckless. The press, uh, paparazzis, you know, they want to get the right shot. They want to get the right story. Uh, but public safety must always be at the forefront. I would find it hard to believe that there was a two-hour high-speed chase. That would be, I find it hard to believe, but we will find out the exact duration of it. But if it's uh, 10 minutes, a 10 minute chase is extremely dangerous in New York City. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. Gabe, this one's kind of a, a weird one here in the U.S. and especially here on the West Coast. We think high speed car chase. You think highways, helicopters, lots of cops in the U.K. You think car chase. Unfortunately, the first thought is of Princess Diana. Uh, but New York, I, it, I'm having a hard time picturing what that looks like. We haven't seen any video yet, only descriptions. Uh, what do we know from those? Uh, well, Gotti, and that is a central question here, right? Was this a chase? Was it a pursuit? Was it just a simply chaotic? It really depends on your vantage point. From the Harry, vantage point of Harry and Meghan, who have been through this many times before, of course, one of the world's most photographed couples, they have said that they have been traumatized by the intense media scrutiny. Now, as you just laid out, even New York City Mayor Eric Adams says that a high-speed chase in New York is very hard to believe. You can see I'm here at the police precinct, and it's very crowded. There's a lot of traffic here in Manhattan. And even as law enforcement say that this pursuit went into the FDR on the fringes of Manhattan, that's a highway at night. But for it to go on for more than two hours, certainly there are a lot of questions swirling around that. As several law enforcement sources tell us that the pursuit lasted for more than an hour, but that it was, again, not nearly catastrophic, but more like chaotic, and there were no arrests as a result of this pursuit, got it. And Gabe, the way I understand it, they were being driven around by their security team. At one point, they were trying to lose the paparazzi. They got out of a car, got into a cab. Do we know anything about that? Right, as far as we know as a timeline, you're right. They left this charity event and then were driven around for a while, ended up at, the, uh, at a police precinct uh, around here and ended up getting into a, a cab. Yes, Harry and Meghan got into a taxi, apparently, and actually spoke with that taxi driver who picked them up. And he says he drove them around for about 10 minutes that they came to a street where uh, it was blocked by a garbage truck. And that's when a swarm of camera uh, people, photographers, came out and started snapping pictures. The cab driver says he didn't feel threatened but he did say it was a, a bit chaotic. Take a listen to what he, he told me just earlier today. They just came out of nowhere, just started flashing, because we were at a complete stop. It was not, the car was not moving because we were blocked by the trash truck. And uh, as there was a cop behind us, so he started blowing his horn. That's when the garbage truck moved, and that's when we started moving. And as we were moving, they got into their car and started following us as well. 
So Daddy, that cab driver says he drove them back to the precinct. They, they then got, eventually got in another car, and then several law enforcement sources say they ended up driving to the Upper East Side where they were staying with a friend. The whole, uh, this all got started because they didn't want the paparazzi to know where that friend lived. Now, one last point on that cab driver, Gotti, we actually just heard the fare for those few minutes that he drove them around, he says, was uh, $17.80. And he says that Harry left a $50 tip. Not bad. A any word from Buckingham Palace? Well, at this point, Gotti, um, no word from Buckingham Palace. Again, uh, at this point, it, it's uh, what we've heard from is the spokesperson for uh, Harry and Meghan, uh, no comment yet um, from Buckingham Palace. And we're trying to find out more information, actually, from the NYPD or that big, big question, Gotti, about any security video that might be released from this incident. Again, a source close to Harry and Meghan says it exists. But as of now, we have not seen it. Got it. Not only security video, we're talking about New York City, a place with so many cameras, uh, cameras inside that car, obviously cameras outside that car pointed at the car. So uh, that's yet to be seen. Gabe Gutierrez, thanks so much. And tonight, Mifepristone, that abortion medication that has dominated headlines, is once again back in the spotlight, this time in Louisiana in a federal appeals court. Remember, Mifepristone is something that's been used for decades in the United States, but the original approval of that medication is now being challenged by a group of doctors who oppose abortion. They say the drug is not as safe as the FDA says it is. And today, lawyers for the FDA took some tough questions from three conservative federal judges in New Orleans. I think the FDA is charged with determining what is relevant for safety and efficacy, and it's certainly not up to lawyers and judges to come in and say, well... well if the FDA didn't consider an important part of the problem, it is our role, correct, to go behind the FDA and determine whether what they did was arbitrary and capricious. Uh, NBC senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett joins us now. Laura, arbitrary and capricious, a uh, pretty rapid response there from one of those judges. Uh, does this look like it's going to be an uphill battle for the FDA? Oh, most certainly, Gotti. This got off to a very rough start for the Biden administration and the pill manufacturer, who both obviously want to keep this drug on the market, and these judges were simply not having it. A lot of hostile questioning right from the jump, and it didn't stop there. Uh, I would say all three of these judges appeared um, unlikely to keep this drug on the market. I should mention two appointed by former President Trump, one appointed, Judge L. Raj, you see there, appointed by uh, former President George W. Bush. And they all essentially seem to buy into the idea that the anti-abortion groups, the plaintiffs here, the doctors, as you mentioned, who are suing over it, have standing. And if they have standing, that's a really big deal um, for these judges to find that. We'll see, obviously, how it comes out, but it's not looking good for the Biden administration. And can you bring us up to speed on how we got here? We were yes. talking about this in Texas, then the Supreme yes. Court, now Louisiana. It seems like there's uh, quite a bit of legal whiplash here. Yes, it's a real mess for folks. But remember, this is really the same case that we were looking at last month when that federal judge in Texas started it all, upending the status quo, invalidating the FDA's 23-year approval of this drug. That's what started it all. That case then went up to the Fifth Circuit on an emergency basis. They did didn't block that judge in Texas, so that's why it went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided to let this, this pill stay on the market, but it's going to let the regular appeals court process play out. So then it went back to the Fifth Circuit, which is why we are in the Fifth Circuit in Louisiana today. But having said all of that, this case is inevitably headed back to the Supreme Court. No matter how the Fifth Circuit rules, essentially that decision is going right back to the high court. And Laura, big picture here, uh, just to recap, what does this mean for access to mifepristone right now? Uh, where is the medication still available and how soon could we see that change nationwide? So right, as of right now, the pill's access has remained unchanged. People can still get it through the mail. They don't have to go to a doctor's office to get it, but that could all be in jeopardy if the Supreme Court does something. And I say if because, again, as of right now, the Supreme Court has put a pause on that lower court that had jeopardized access to the pill. And so no matter what the Fifth Circuit does, everything will maintain the status quo. The only thing that could jeopardize access to the pill is if the Supreme Court decides to weigh in here, Gotti. Lord Jarrett, thanks so much. Sure.
Meanwhile, the fight over abortion is heating up over in North Carolina, where the Democratic governor vetoed a bill restricting abortion, and the state's Republican-led legislature just voted to override that veto, which means, by law, most abortions will be banned after 12 weeks, starting in July. Up until now, North, North Carolina was considered a safe haven for those looking to have an abortion from other states with even stronger restrictions nearby. And the only reason Republican lawmakers are able to pass that measure is because they hold a veto-proof supermajority after a former Democratic representative switched parties. Now, voters on both sides have been sharing their reactions since last night. The fact that these 140 now Republicans get to call themselves the supermajority when they are clearly passing bills that just don't represent the majority of North Carolinians, that's what we're really upset about. By and large, the people of the state are just family values, conservative people. You know, we're not activists. We shouldn't all have to be activists out here trying to save children from being killed. NBC's Shaq Brewster joins us now from Raleigh, North Carolina. Shaq, can you walk us through the details of this law? Because there are some exceptions, right? That's exactly right, Gotti. Let's start with that headline. That's the one that you're seeing all over. And it's the main change that you're seeing here. It's 12 weeks. Most abortions will be banned in the state of North Carolina after 12 weeks. Now, you mentioned the exceptions. In cases of rape and incest, that limit moves up to 20 weeks. And in cases of what's being called a, a fetal abnormality, that goes up to 24 weeks. But that's just part of the bill. This is about a 46 page. Uh, pay 46 page piece of legislation uh, that got passed. So it also includes new restrictions for abortion clinics, uh, new paperwork that they have to go through. And there's also restrictions on how people can get, how women can get abortion. Specifically, women must now go and have an, a doctor's appointment in person and then have to wait 72 hours before they get that abortion care. So it's a pretty comprehensive piece of legislation, but the big headline there is that that window in which women who are seeking abortion can get it is now closing from about 20 weeks to 12, Gotti. And Jack, I know you talked to the House Speaker about all this. How are they characterizing this? Yeah, you know, they're acknowledging that this is a win. This is something that they've been fighting for for some time. They also said that this, the speaker also acknowledged this is a compromise for his party. But, you know, I did ask him about that provision I mentioned about the added appointment uh, for the for women seeking abortion, the fact that they need to get an, an, uh, an appointment and do that in person. I asked him what was the medical basis for that, because some of the criticism is that there is none. Listen to what he said. So we really relied upon what the physicians were telling us. We relied on uh, what, what you know, doctors were telling us, even some doctors who maybe didn't support the bill. Because but, I, but like doctors we've talked to said that's not a need, that they can, ha they can address that care and give women that care even without the direct in-person appointment. I think there's probably a difference of opinion among medical, medical professionals. One thing that you've been hearing from Governor Cooper, the Democratic governor in this state who ended up vetoing this legislation, uh, was that although it is a 12-week abortion ban on paper, because of restrictions like the one we were discussing there, uh, that would lead to a near total ban for some women in the state. There's also other provisions that require certain abortions to be done in a hospital. Uh, many counties don't have a hospital or don't have one nearby. So the impact of this law something that could be felt a little bit more widely than the number suggests. And that's the argument that you've been hearing from opponents to this move. I've seen a lot of people starting to talk about uh, mounting a challenge, but with the supermajority, uh, what does a challenge even look like? Yeah, a challenge would be incredibly hard because you mentioned this This is a supermajority. So despite it having the veto stamp on the original bill, uh, the supermajority, the Republicans in the legislature were able to pass this and enact it, and it'll now be in place on July 1st. There is always the legal front there and the legal fight that can come about. I spoke with the president of the regional Planned Parenthood chapter and asked her directly, is that the next fight to come? She said, possibly there are some terms in the bill, some provisions that uh, contradict one another in her phrase, some for provisions that aren't medically um, sound. So she thinks there might be an opportunity there. They said they're still reviewing that. But she ultimately acknowledged something that I think Republicans have acknowledged and Democrats have 
driving knowledge as well in this state. And that's this is going to come down to future elections. Uh, one thing that Republicans have said is that they're not looking to expand or to uh, go and um, have new restrictions on abortions, at least within the next two years. What that sets up is the potential of there being a new governor, a new legislature. That's when you can have changes to the law that was just passed. So although this is set for now in the legislature, this uh, might not be much room for this uh, in the judicial branch, there's a chance that this is something that voters will be able to have their say on in just a couple of years. 2024. Thanks so much, Shaq. And President Biden is flying to Japan right now on his way to meet G7 allies for a very quick trip, a lot shorter than originally planned because back home, the debt ceiling negotiations are still up in the air. Yesterday, both the president and House Speaker McCarthy seemed to be optimistic after the last talks. But there's still no deal. Joining us now from Hiroshima, Japan, is NBC's Mike Mimili. Mike, uh, what are the main sticking points here? Well, Gotti, one of the reasons why there's been such concern about the U.S. potentially for the first time defaulting is because for a long time, both sides couldn't even agree on what they were discussing, what they were negotiating about. What this really boils down to is both sides say, yes, they want to reduce the federal deficit, but they disagree strongly on how to do it. President Biden has put out a budget which relies on increasing revenue. That includes raising some taxes on the highest earners. Republicans have said raising taxes is a non-starter for them. They want to slash federal spending. And so now, even as the president insists he's not negotiating over the debt ceiling, the two sides have delegated some of their top lieutenants to meet over the next few days while the president is traveling here in Japan. They're going to try and find some potential areas of compromise, maybe including uh, returning some of that unspent COVID relief funding. It could be work requirements, an issue that Republicans are championing, that the president has signaled some openness to, but that many in his own party will oppose if that's part of a deal. Uh, ultimately, though, this is going to come down to finding really nickels and dimes in the federal couch cushions uh, that will allow both sides to say that they're saving face here, making some progress in reducing the deficit. A long way to go, though, and 15 days to get there. It's going to be really important that there's some significant progress while the president is here in Japan, because when he returns, Congress only has a limited amount of time to get this done. Is there anything specific on what could be slashed? Well, the president has laid out mostly areas where he would increase revenue, and the, the Republicans so far in the legislation that they've passed have only said that they want overall levels of federal spending reduced to a certain amount. So they haven't specified within the very massive federal code where those specifics will come from. That's led to both sides having arguments about, well, Republicans are, are uh, threatening to cut for instance, veterans support programs. That's what the White House has been arguing. Remember, Kevin McCarthy accused the president of lying about that, but without a detailed specific budget plan, they're not likely to get there. And Gotti, ultimately, when the two sides do reach a quote unquote deal, it's not going to have specifics either. It'll basically say they want to trim this much overall in the federal budget, and then they'll have another four or five months until the usual round of federal budget fights are happening in September to then boil down to the specifics. So this is all about reaching what they call in budget speak a top line number and then figuring out the details later. And what should we expect from the G7 uh, once President Biden gets there? Well, the first order of business, the president's going to have a one-on-one -on -one, one meeting with Japan's prime minister, Fumio Kishida. You'll hear a lot of talk in the first few days of this summit, Gotti, about Ukraine. The president's very proud of the fact that he's been able to keep, especially our European allies, united in the face of Russia's aggression there. He's also going to shine a spotlight on the fact that Japan, not a NATO member, but somebody who has really stepped up to the plate to support Ukraine. In fact, this the third biggest country in terms of direct aid to Ukraine here. And we're doing this in Hiroshima of course, a city where the one of only two where the atomic bomb was dropped. There is concerns, of course, about Russia deploying potentially uh, nuclear weapons to the battlefield. So an interesting backdrop for that. But really, this whole trip, Gotti, was meant to, on the part of the United States, be a show of force among democracies in the backyard of China. China has certainly, over the last decade especially, been working to expand their influence, not just in this region, but across the world. And the, the Western allies, and the G7 countries, countries, uh, as well as some of the other democracies, including Australia, which is invited to join uh, this meeting here uh, in Japan, attempting to really show that there's a better deal for the developing world by aligning themselves with democratic countries instead. Mike Mimili, thanks so much. 
And First Lady Joe Biden was in Alaska today working to bring more broadband connectivity to homes on tribal lands. And it's an effort the Biden administration has been working on through something called the Affordable Connectivity Program. But now programs like that are at risk. NBC's Zinkle Isamwa has a story. I live in a woods and I need Wi-Fi. Retiree Lori May is a member of Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota. She lives on a limited income, and today she's signing up for discounted broadband internet through the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP, which risks running out of funding by 2024. There is a large need for internet service here. What is the Affordable Connectivity Program? The Affordable Connectivity Program is the nation's largest broadband affordability effort in our history. The $14.2 billion initiative is funded by the Biden administration's bipartisan infrastructure bill. And if Congress doesn't fund the program again or incorporate it into other budgets, it likely won't exist past 2024. ACP provides up to $30 off or $75 off on tribal lands of monthly internet services to households. It's a program meant to help families who are struggling to get online to stay online and make sure they have the connections they need to succeed in today's age. Families who qualify are those eligible for at least one of the following, free and reduced lunch, SNAP, WIC, Medicaid, federal housing assistance, SSI, and some veteran benefit and tribal assistance programs. For many Red Lake Nation members, ACP is a lifeline. We deal with poverty, so this program really helps out our people. As of May 15th, more than 18 million households have signed up, but still only 35% of eligible households are enrolled according to the FCC. The ACP criticized by some for a complicated sign-up process, complaints I asked the FCC about. Is there a way to simplify the application process at all? We've actually recently made some enhancements to do that, to do that exact work, um, specifically streamlining uh, the application once you actually interact with it, making sure those qualifying questions are earlier in the process. Paloma Perez, the FCC press secretary, saying the benefits to Internet access far outweigh the drawbacks. For Red Lake Nation, as funding for the ACP faces a potential end, the need for Internet access remains far from finished. I probably have to cut something else out of my bill in order to continue receiving Wi-Fi. You know, I think it is important that we keep that funding going so... You know, we do have, you know, a bright future for our, our young ones and for all of our band members, our community members. Our thanks to Zinkle Asimov for that. And we've got much more to get to this hour, including a grand jury indictment for the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students, plus a new lawsuit against Florida over controversial book bans, why parents and book publishing giants are fighting back. And in America, colon cancer is the fourth deadliest of all cancers, but artificial intelligence is changing how it's detected. It could save lives. Stay tuned now. Welcome back. Here are some of the headlines we're watching tonight. A powerful explosion caught on video has left dozens hurt in Tijuana, Mexico. It happened just a few miles south of the San Ysidro border crossing. Search and rescue crews are still looking for more victims under the rubble, and it's still not clear what caused that explosion. In Virginia, the man accused of attacking Congressman Jerry Connolly's staff with a baseball bat this week is now facing a federal assault charge. According to a newly filed affidavit by the FBI, the man hit one woman in the head and another in the ribs. He told one of them, quote, I'm going to kill you. You're going to die. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has signed four bills today that further restrict LGBTQ rights across the state. The bills expand Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay Law. They also ban transition-related care from transgender minors, prevent trans people from using bathrooms with their preferred identity, and ban drag performances in front of minors. The U.S. attorney in Massachusetts says that she will be resigning. Rachel Rollins made the announcement a day before the Justice Department investigation found she leaked information to the press and lied to investigators. Rollins is expected to officially step down tomorrow. And if you've owned a Jeep Cherokee SUV from 2014 to 2016, you might want to listen up. More than 200,000 of them have been recalled because they can catch on fire even when they're off. The company says they will be sending out a notification to owners in late June and that there's no fix for the problem just yet. 
Meanwhile, the man suspected of killing four University of Idaho students has been formally indicted by a grand jury on murder charges. The 28-year-old Brian Kohlberger is being accused of stabbing Ethan Chapin, Maddie Mogan, Zana Carnodal, and Kylie Gonzalez last November. And it took weeks for investigators to name a suspect in the case and arrest Kohlberger. He was linked to the murders from DNA found on a knife sheath and is set to be arraigned on Monday. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins us now. Uh, Steve, so now he's been indicted by this grand jury. What's next? Uh, when can we expect to see him fully arraigned? Yeah, so the fact that there is now no preliminary hearing greatly accelerates this case by far. So now we expect on Monday an arraignment to be held. He's expected to also enter a plea. Now we can make some inferences. The plea is expected to be not guilty because of what his attorney, his former attorney, has made statements of saying that he expects his client to be exonerated. From there, unless he waives his speedy trial, um, we could see some action as far as a trial in the next six weeks or so. Got it. And this comes as somewhat of a surprise, right? There was a preliminary preliminary hearing set. There was a date set. Everyone thought it was going to be in late June, and then all of a sudden this happens. Can we uh, can we read into that at all, or is this just procedural? We can read into it. We, we won't know exactly why, because there's still a gag order on this case, right? So all parties involved can't really talk about the case. We can make some inferences, though, right? So one is that, if you want to talk about it from a strategic perspective, this is now behind closed doors, because there's no preliminary hearing. It would have lasted for at least a week or so in front of a judge in front of really the public, this is now just the grand jury, the judge, and the prosecution. So if there's anything that they have up their sleeve, if they're calling any witnesses, you know, we're not going to know how that witness would do under the pressure of cross-examination. So that's part of it. If you want to talk about the witnesses themselves, they're expected to be some of the kids that were also in, those, in that house, the survivors. They don't want to go through the speculation, through the spectacle of being in front of a, a jury in a courtroom. Now they don't have to do that. Um, and then thirdly, Talking about the spectacle, you know, there's no media. There's no, um, there's no going to be no motion for cameras in court. There's going to be no weeks of speculation because it is now a grand jury and it's behind closed doors. So those are the reasons that we can infer. But again, with that gag order still on, we won't know exactly. Guys. A lot of reasons that that makes perfect yeah. sense. Steve Patterson, thanks so much. And still to come, a Missouri student is suspended after recording her teacher using a racial slur. But what happened to the teacher? That story is straight ahead. But first, you gotta see this. This is Annie, and she is just shy of her 100th birthday. So last week, an early present, she went to the circus, because, well, in her words, I've always wanted to have knives thrown at me. Take a look. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad they got close, but still, whew. Annie used to work at Zippo's Circus in England, putting up posters for some 30 years. She says, having knives thrown at her has been a lifetime dream, dream come true, Annie. Ha, huh. good job. And welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle say paparazzi chased them in cars through New York City last night. Police are working to piece together the timeline of how it all played out. The federal court in Louisiana heard arguments about the future of medical abortions. They are weighing whether a judge's ruling to suspend access to Mifepristone should stand. And a grand jury has indicted the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students. Brian Kohlberger will be arriving on Monday. A high school student is fighting back after she was suspended from school for recording her teacher using a racial slur in class. NBC's Maya England has a story. This exchange between a geometry teacher who used the N-word repeatedly and his student at Glendale High School in Springfield, Missouri, is brewing a firestorm of controversy. The video obtained by NBC News affiliate KYTV was recorded by 15-year-old sophomore Mary Walton last week. Walton was then suspended for three days because she violated the school's policy on recording faculty members without their approval. 
Glendale High School principal Josh Groves said in a message to the high school community on May 9th that the teacher's comments expressed on the video were inappropriate, inexcusable, and do not meet the professional standards for Springfield Public School employees. While the Springfield Public School District released a statement justifying the decision to suspend Mary, citing the student handbook policy on electronic devices, and saying the teacher who used the racial slur in class is no longer employed by the district. I don't know if it would have happened that quickly without this video. An investigation certainly would have taken longer. Natalie Hall is the attorney representing Mary and her family. We've asked them to lift the suspension, let her go back to school immediately, and apologize. Mary saw something that she believed needed to be reported. The president of the Radio Television Digital News Association defending Mary's decision to record the incident. The issue of right to record public officials really came to fruition in the days after the tragic death of George Floyd. And bear in mind, the world would not have seen the full picture of what happened to George Floyd were it not for a 17-year-old girl who stood on the sidewalk and videotaped the entire incident. The president of the Media Association criticizing the school's handbook that prohibits recording of faculty or staff in the classroom. I think the handbook policy as currently written is unconstitutional. More than half the U.S district courts of appeal have unequivocally stated that citizens have a right lawfully to record the activities of public officials. The teacher's name has not been released by the school district. The district declined to comment to NBC News on whether it will be reevaluating its policy, expunge Mary's suspension, or apologize to her, citing student confidentiality. And as for 15-year-old Mary Walton... She's dealing with anxiety. She doesn't really understand what she did wrong. It makes me sad because she did bring something to light that needed to be brought to light. Maya Eaglin, thanks so much for that. In Florida, the effort to ban some books has reached a fever pitch. Today, the publishing giant Penguin Random House, alongside some writers and parents, filed a federal lawsuit against a school district in Pensacola, saying that by removing and restricting books that discuss both race and LGBTQ identity, the school district and the school board are violating the First Amendment. And joining us now is NBC's Antonia Hilton. Uh, Antonia, what are the specific allegations in this lawsuit? Well, Gotti, this lawsuit was filed this morning, and it's a coalition, as you mentioned, of the largest publisher, members of the community who are parents of kids who are in this district right now, and then a number of children's book authors uh, and young adult uh, novelists as well. And they're alleging that the actions of this school district have violated children's First Amendment and 14th Amendment rights. That's the Equal Protection Clause. And that's because what they allege in this lawsuit is that the school district has at times violated their own policies and processes to remove books that disproportionately represent stories that involve LGBTQ children and their families, as well as different minority families. And it's really on the side of the parents and the kids who are at, sta at stake in all of this here, they say they want access to these kinds of diverse materials, that being in a public school should give them access to materials that reflect the public. I want to take a bit of a listen to George M. Johnson. They're one of the authors of one of the most banned books in this district and other parts of the country as well. My book sits at the intersection of blackness as well as queerness, um, among a myriad of other topics. And my book also tells the truth, uh, which we know that this country has an issue with. And so when you have a book that is uh, telling a firsthand account of what it is like to grow up in this country being black and queer and giving representation to a community that rarely gets to see themselves seen in books, seen on television, uh, it creates an empowerment for those students. Many of the parents who have fought to have these kinds of books removed have labeled stories that involve LGBTQ characters as pornographic, as inappropriate. Uh, what the authors have pushed back and said is that they depict, you know, first crushes or relationships or family problems that have been presented in schools and with, you know, classic nuclear families or straight couples in the past, uh, but seem to only cause an issue for these parents uh, once LGBTQ people were involved, Gotti. And has the school board responded? So the school board has not released an official statement as a body, but I was able to reach one of the members by phone this morning, a man named Bill Slayton, who represents their District 5. And at first, when we talked, 
Bill was very surprised about this lawsuit, not because of its contents, but more so because what he said to me is that this school district is engaged in something that districts around the state are doing. You know, they're removing books. Parents are coming forward. It's part of the culture war that has spread not just in Florida, but around this country. And he insisted that they were not just following the rules as they were in the districts, but in fact, what he believed they had been told by the state government. In other words, the DeSantis administration, Gotti. Antonia Hilton, thanks so much. And today, they are, there are some astonishing new 3D images of the Titanic out. They are providing the most incredible view we've ever seen of that historic shipwreck. NBC's Tom Costello has more. The images are breathtaking in their clarity and detail. The Titanic broken into 1,200 feet below the North Atlantic. Too big for a single photo, the new 3D scan combining 700,000 images reveals the full scale of the disaster. The bow covered in rust, its anchor still attached. The boiler room where workers shoveled coal to keep the lights on. The propeller, its serial number still legible. Scattered on the ocean floor, unopened champagne bottles, shoes, hats, and jewelry. 1,500 people died that day in 1912. Edith Hazeman was just 16 on board with her parents. We talked to her in 1996. I never forget it. See all the dead bodies floating in the sea. It was terrible. A deep sea mapping company used submersibles to create this 360 degree view. Coming soon, a documentary looking at how an iceberg cut open a ship once branded unsinkable. This makes the Titanic tragedy much more real. There's no doubt about that. People around the world will be able to walk around the Titanic for themselves and they'll be able to see the wreck, they'll be able to see the debris field. This is a history where we can live in the past. A virtual view preserved forever. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Wow, to be able to see serial numbers, wild. NBC's Tom Costello, thanks so much. And coming up, Russian forces say they have killed an American in Ukraine. We're gonna tell you more about the Idaho native coming up next. Now, a quick check of the headlines around the world in 80 seconds. In North Korea, a newly released photo shows Kim Jong-un examining a military spy satellite. Now, according to North Korean authorities, Kim plans to launch in a few weeks, and it would use long-range missile technology that's already been banned by past U.N. Res resolutions. Kim reportedly said that it is crucial for countering the U.S. and South Korea threat. In Mexico, a super controversial story where a woman who killed her rapist has been sentenced to six years in prison. Now, earlier this week, a court found that the woman had been raped, but also found her guilty of homicide with, quote, excessive use of legitimate defense. According to local reports, she strangled him during the attack, while the court went on to say that hitting the man in the head would have been enough to defend herself. And you know that sharks kill roughly 10 people each year while hippos kill about 500 people? Yesterday in East Africa, a hippopotamus attacked a canoe full of people. Authorities say seven people are dead and at least 17 are still missing. And a Nepali Sherpa, Sherpa has made history by climbing Mount Everest for a record 27th time. And get this, 53-year-old broke his own record. He did it all while helping a guide, uh, guide another climber. Kami Rita first climbed Everest in 1994, and with the exception of three years, he has done it every year since. And another American has died in Ukraine. Retired U.S. Special Forces soldier Nicholas Maimar died while fighting alongside Ukrainians in Bakhmut. The 45-year-old Idaho native was interviewed by NBC News earlier this year, where he said he was compelled to go help Ukraine given his own military background. And Maimar trained volunteers and helped Ukraine's military develop its own training plans. NBC's Molly Hunter has more. The fiercest fighting in this country is taking place around Bakhmut. That is that eastern city we have focused so heavily on in the last couple of months and really where the battle, where the front line has been focused on in the last couple of months between regular Russian forces and the Wagner mercenary group and Ukrainian soldiers on the other side. This week, though, Ukrainian officials say they feel like they have the momentum. They have made their biggest battlefield advances in months 
just in the last couple of days, recapturing eight square miles. It doesn't sound like much, but that is huge, and they are certainly trying to capitalize on that momentum. Also out of Bakhmut this week, we learned from the family of a volunteer American soldier, 45-year-old Nicholas Mamer, that he was killed on the battlefield. Actually, just a couple of months ago, my colleague Raf Sanchez, NBC News correspondent who was here in Kyiv, met Nicholas Mamer, spoke with him. Take a listen to what he had to say. So why did you come out to Ukraine? Uh, I actually uh, was already in Europe uh, for uh, another job. And uh, I think in recent his, um, in kind of recent history, this is one of the most clear cut uh, violations of human rights and uh, national sovereignty that we've seen. Uh, and so I, I would, I personally, with my background, I knew I was compelled to come help. Now, Raf also asked him about uh, going east. Had he been to the east of the country yet? Had he fought on the eastern front lines yet? Back in February, he had not, but he said absolutely he was committed to this cause, he was committed to this country, and that is certainly something he was willing and prepared to do. And if his family, of course, uh, believes the stories and the information they have been gathering the last couple of days, it sounds like Nicholas Mamer did make it to Bakhmut to the eastern front line, and that is where he died. Molly, thank you. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. We're going to show you how artificial intelligence could revolutionize cancer screening and even help doctors out during colonoscopies. Stay close. Uh, tonight, the future of everything starts in Montana, which is now the first state to ban TikTok. Today, the state's governor signed the country's first bill to outright ban the popular app. He was expected to sign the measure after the legislature passed it last month. The law bans any new downloads of the app in the state, and it also bans mobile app stores from offering TikTok within the state. And a statement from TikTok says the bill infringes on the First Amendment rights of the people in Montana. The ban is scheduled to go into effect on January 1st, but it is likely to face uh, quite a few legal challenges. Now to AI and the future of filmmaking. Listen to this hypothetical scenario we heard tonight from MSNBC host Ari Melber during an interview with Tom Hanks. The person who should play Tom Hanks in a biopic. <sighs> uh, because of deep fake technology and AI, I believe I can play myself. <laughs> in my that own, may, but in would my it be you if it was a deep fake? Well, I don't know, but even if I'm dead and gone, I'll, my intellectual property rights will be in place and I'll still get paid. Well, artificial intelligence is already pro proving to be quite the game changer in hospitals and medical facilities around the world. We've talked about how AI is being used for everything from brain surgery to mind reading and the potential of revolutionizing cancer detection. Now, tonight we're going to talk about colonoscopies. It turns out AI is helping doctors prevent future colorectal uh, cancer diagnoses, and we're going to show you how it works. Just a warning, a colonoscopy is an invasive procedure. Procedure. So here it is. On the left, a doctor is scanning the area with their naked eye. On the right, the same scan is happening, but using AI assistance. See that little green bo box that keeps popping up? That's the AI showing the doctor an area of concern, and it allows them to take a closer look. Now, a recent study pre predicts that AI-assisted scans like this could reduce future cancer diagnoses by up to 39%. Let's bring in NBC medical fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal. Uh, Dr. Sayal, how is AI able to detect those spots so fast and in, in real time? Hey, Gadi, yeah, this is this is really cool. I mean, so what we're talking about is using deep learning that these machines have been fed over and over colonoscopies and pictures of what a healthy colon should look like and pictures of what a healthy colon doesn't look like. And through deep learning, it's been able to actually detect this better than the human eye by about 13 percent, which Northwestern, who led the study, is estimating this could reduce future cancer diagnosis by up to 39 percent. But why is this a big deal? You know, up to 25 percent of polyps in the in the colon when you get a colonoscopy uh, colonoscopy can be missed. And if you miss those polyps, people can still get colon cancer, even though they've had those colonoscopies we always talk about. And so, you know, in talking to the doctors who led this study, what they're telling me is that it's really comforting for the doctors to have that AI by the side, looking over their shoulder, almost like a little mentor or supervisor to make sure that they're getting all the areas of concern in a, in a patient, Gadi.
<laughs> comforting for the doctors, uh, I think comforting for the patients too. I mean, I imagine like if you're a patient, you're like, no, no, I want a doctor and I want AI. I want everybody to check as much as humanly possible. Um, I know this is gonna be a, a huge deal because according to the World Health Organization, uh, this type of cancer makes up like 9% of global cancer deaths. Is this technology widespread enough to make a, a pretty big difference soon? Like when I go to the doctor, can I ask for this? That's, that's the excellent question. And this is the first time in a long time that we've talked where I can say this is available today. Uh, Gotti, this device is FDA approved. Northwestern, who led the study, because of the results of their study, are making this the standard of care, meaning everybody June 1st, starting June 1st, who wants to get a colonoscopy can actually ask for an AI-assisted colonoscopy. And it's not just Northwestern. Facilities all across the country are starting to realize there's some real potential here for reducing colon cancer diagnoses. So absolutely, if you are out there, look, someone who, who needs needs to get a colonoscopy, do ask if, if an AI-assisted one is an option. Uh, Dr. Akshay, but wait, there's more moment. We are here for that. Um, all right, final question. When should people start getting regular colonoscopies? Like, I'm about 40 now. What are the symptoms to, to, to look out for, and how regularly should you be getting checked out? Yeah, you're getting there, Gotti. So it's, it's about age 45 when, when most people should start to get colonoscopies. Now, it's going to vary depending on your personal and family medical history. Um, but about age 45, and just to review the symptoms here, you know, we, we want to look for changes in your poop patterns. As, as gross as that sounds, are you pooping? Are you having a lot of diarrhea out of nowhere? Are you having, maybe you're not going, maybe, you're, maybe your poop is just really, really thin, or maybe you're even feeling tired and your poop is normal. There's really a wide variety of symptoms, which is why we encourage this regular screening starting at the age of 45 for most people. <laughs> Dr. Akshay Sayal, thanks so much, brother. Yeah. And one thing that is great about our smartphones is how we have everything at the touch of a button, right? But it also means that our phones aren't only uh, valuable, it's something that thieves want these days. They are after our data too. So how do you keep your information safe? Well, NBC's Stephanie Gosk has a look. Just behind the locked screen of an iPhone, a gold mine of money, memories, and connections. And thieves have found a way in. They're stealing your passcode. It's so sinister. It's so sinister, but also so simple. So they go to places where people are vulnerable. Drunk. People are vulnerable. Yeah. They're drunk. They're having a good time. Oh, Joanna Stern covers tech for the Wall Street Journal. She's done a series of reports exposing a new crime wave. Phones being ripped off at bars, leading to tens of thousands of dollars stolen and Apple accounts locked. I was blown away by how many people I heard from that had been to different cities across the U.S. NBC's digital team also helped uncover a ring of thieves allegedly targeting gay bars in Manhattan. Victims are drugged, their phones stolen. Two men, John Umberger and Julio Ramirez, overdosed and died. Three suspects are charged with murder. Taylor Ashey says he too was drugged and a victim of theft, waking up after a night out and realizing his phone was gone. I immediately got up, went to check my computer um, to see what was going on, had about 20 to 25 fraud alert emails. He says the thieves changed his Apple ID password, locked him out, and then went on a shopping spree. They added my um, credit cards to Apple Pay, which I had not previously used, and then they went around New York City using my phone as a credit card. Ashy would get roughly $15,000 back, but what he couldn't get restored was his Apple account. Hours of conversations with Apple support staff. I never received my, my information back. We're talking about personal photos, contacts? All the above. The key is getting the passcode. How quickly can you change my Apple ID? All right, so I'm going to tap here at the top. This is your iCloud or Apple ID uh -huh. area. I'm going to password and security. I'm going to change password. I'm going to put in your passcode. It's in, is that right? And you're there. And I'm there. It took her 18 seconds, but there's more. These thieves on the streets know how to enable something that's a pretty hidden setting. It's called this recovery key. The recovery key is supposed to add another layer of protection. The problem is, is that the thieves have the recovery key. Once you've changed someone's Apple ID password and turned on this recovery key, it's basically game over for the person whose account that is. In a statement, Apple says, we take all attacks on our users very seriously, no matter how rare. We work tirelessly every day to protect our users' accounts and data and are always investigating additional protections. There are some steps to take. Make the passcode on the iPhone stronger, like using six digits instead of four. You can also go here to passcode options 
and do a custom alphanumeric code. Another option is going to screen time, then content and privacy restrictions, where there are several places you can add a four-digit code that will block access. The changes will make the phone less convenient. I feel like it's Fort Knox on my phone now. But with life's most important information in the palm of your hand, the hassle may be worth it. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We're going to see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.